Hey everybody, this week we're going to be discussing pain, anxiety, and depression. So some of the objectives of this lecture. What is the relationship between the three? What is the, neuro the neurophysiology behind it? And then what are the central consequences? So before we dive into the literature, I'm just going to show you guys a couple of pictures just to get that right brain activated. Um, but basically, this just kind of shows a nice little web of chronic pain. So the biological factors that are associated with it, the psychological factors that are associated with it, which we'll be discussing anxiety and depression, the social uh, factors, and then the health-related quality of life factors. So this is known as the uh, fear-based model of chronic pain. Um, and Basically what happens is, is <clears throat> as you see here, pain creates a pain experience. And if that person sees that pain experience and has no fear and they confront that pain experience, they will do well with recovery. If they experience pain and then they further fear the pain, which leads to an avoidance of the activity, it can lead to disuse of the uh, musculoskeletal system, we'll say in this case disability of the area that's been affected, and depression. And as we know, um, if you don't use it, you lose it. So with that, it'll further drive the pain experience and uh, the patient will have pain. Same thing here. Uh, these are the, the vicious circles of pain, both the physical and psychological. So here on the right, patient experiences pain. They avoid the activity. Because they're avoiding the activity, there's progressive deconditioning. Uh, then when they try to engage in activity, there's increased pain um, with decreasing activity. So they further avoid the activity, which leads to further deconditioning, which doesn't allow for the brain to be able to modulate pain appropriately, which leads to pain. On the psychological vicious circle side, patient experiences pain, that pain can lead to some anger, anxiety, fear, or distress. This puts them into an impoverished mood, which can lead to depression. With depression, alterations in brain function, inability to uh, see the glass half full. So there's an increased perception of pain, which leads to more pain, and it continues on and on in a vicious circle. So. Uh, we're going to start out with this article here from 2005. I know that's a little old, but I thought it did a decent job of giving us a little bit of overview of what we're going to talk about. It doesn't go too much into depth, but it's a good start. So the psychology of pain. So the perception of pain involves far more than just mere sensation. The effective and evaluated evaluative components of pain are often as important as the production and transmission of the pain signal. These emotional aspects are most prominent in chronic pain patients, but knowledge of the psychology of pain can greatly improve the treatment of acute pain as well. So this is good to know for the clinical setting. Pain and its perception. So the limbic system where the emotions are processed, it modulates the amount of pain experienced for given noxious stimulus. It's been shown in cancer patients that the effective component of pain can be completely blocked by frontal lobectomy. If anybody's doing those in the clinic, we should probably have a conversation. But lobectomized patients still register severe pain, it just doesn't bother them. So pain can thus be viewed as merely a signal from the periphery that something is wrong somewhere in the body until it reaches the emotional brain where the signal becomes what we feel is pain. The emotional response to pain involves the anterior cingulate gyrus and also the right ventral prefrontal cortex. So good things to know for later on in the discussion. I duplicated that slide on accident. So mood disorders. In a study of chronic pain patients on opioids, 61% were found to have major depression. It appears that the pain causes depression at least as often as depression causes pain. Nonetheless, depression is known to make the patient's pain feel worse. In post-surgical patients' uh, pain after cholecystectomy, the patients who had even subclinical depressive symptoms reported a higher pain. So treating depression can improve and in some cases eliminate chronic pain. 
Whether depression is considered to be a cause or an effect of chronic pain, it should be considered at least a comorbid condition that requires concurrent treatment. An anxiety disorder was found in 10.6% of chronic work-related musculoskeletal pain patients. The lifetime risk of a major anxiety disorder in men who have chronic low back pain is 30.9% compared with 14.3% in men who do not have low back pain. It is likely that some chronic pain patients are actually using opioid medications to self-treat anxiety and depression, which is an off-label use. Instead of relying on more effective anxio um, Lytic or antidepressant agents. So they're using the wrong drug for their condition. What little subjective benefit they initially feel is actually rapidly lost with tolerance and replaced with dependence, unfortunately. Anxiety, fear, and a sense of loss of control contribute to patient suffering. So treating anxiety and providing psychological support has been shown to improve pain and reduce analgesic use. <clears throat> Improving patients sense of control and allowing them to participate in their care has also been shown to be helpful. So all my patients that come in and they have chronic pain, I always try to be, or I try to make them as proactive as possible in their pain management, um, making sure that they know that, you know, I'm here to help them, but also that they need to be active in their treatment as well, doing some things, doing stretches, doing a certain exercises to help modulate the pain. I feel that uh, if you do that, a lot of patients that do have or suffer from anxiety and depression along with chronic pain, they lose that confidence. Uh, they lose that, that sense of uh, the ability to control their emotions, um, control their feelings. So by getting people involved and actively participating in their care as opposed to just you know providing a chiropractic adjustment or some sort of manipulative treatment, you're really putting them in the driver's seat to help uh, their brain get better, but also to help their symptoms improve as well. Chronic pain patients commonly have problems with the psychological and emotional aspects of pain. Pre-existing psychological factors have been shown to be very important in the development of chronic pain after surgery and in complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS, tension type headaches, and fibromyalgia. So, I'm actually going to do, if anyone follows my, um, I have a Facebook page, it started out as something really silly, but it's called Brain Chat, and what I started doing is basically talking about neuroplasticity and uh, available therapies for patients. I also started interviewing doctors who were doing some really cool things. So in a few weeks, I'll actually be interviewing Dr. David Hanscom, who wrote the book Back in Control. He's a spinal surgeon. Um who basically has put himself out of business teaching people to be able to modulate their pain by doing what I would what I think they are is after I read the book is they're very functional exercises in nature just altering the pain's the brain's perception of pain so check that out um, it's on my Facebook page it's called Brain Chat uh, it'll be I believe July third he's a nice guy he's um yeah he just found. He found out ways to really help people um, change their pain perception and didn't feel the need that he needed to do surgery anymore. So pretty cool stuff. <clears throat> there is a vicious cycle in which pain causes disability and stress, which in turn worsens the perception of pain. Unhealthy lifestyle, lack of social support, depressive illness, substance abuse, they're all predisposing factors to chronic pain. It's been referred to as a complex to, as complex when there are interactions of legal, psychological, medication, and family issues. Excuse me, issues. Chronic pain is is complex and it's multifactorial in nature. So it's it takes a it takes a lot to try to understand it and just try to figure out the best way to treat it. In my opinion. So I duplicated that side as well. An accident. Sorry, guys. So here's another good um, article that I went through and I provided it on Signet for you. Uh, Depression and Anxiety by Adam Wu. Um, so a couple summary points from the article. Mood disorders, especially depression and anxiety, play an important role in the exacerbation of pain perception in all clinical settings. Depression commonly occurs as a result of chronic pain and needs treating to improve outcome measures and quality of life. Anxiety negatively affects thoughts and behaviors, which hinders rehabilitation. 
Anxiety and depression in acute hospital settings also negatively affect pain experience and should be considered in both adults and children. And poor pain control and significant mood disorders preoperatively contribute to the development of chronic pain, uh, postoperative pain. And that is actually, I believe, why Dr. David Hanscom wrote his book, Back in Control. So, cool book. Uh, check it out. So pain concepts have moved radically away from the early nociceptive Cartesian principle where a specific lesion of the body is experienced as pain by the brain. This has been replaced by the widely accepted biopsychosocial model where tissue damage, psychology, and environmental factors all interact to determine the pain experience. The ICEPS definition of pain as unpleasant um, as an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience associated with tissue damage, further emphasizes the significant role of mood and emotions for pain perception. Among these, depression and anxiety have been implicated as important contributors to the experience of pain and have been extensively studied. The scale of the problem. In association of chronic pain with depression, has been of great interest, I'm sorry, the association of chronic pain with depression has been of great interest in the past few decades. Chronic musculoskeletal pain patients have higher depression than individuals without pain in a general population study. A third of patients in a pain clinic population had major depression according to the criteria of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 4, which I know is old, this paper is from 2010, following structured interviews. The presence of pain can make recognition of depression more difficult, <clears throat> even though increased severity of pain worsens depressive symptoms. So some of the tools uh, that you can use to assess depression in your office, I use the DAS, so the Depression, Anxiety, and Stress Scale, because it tests both depression and anxiety. A lot of my patients that come in are stroke patients with chronic pain or concussion patients with chronic pain. So it kind of gives me a good foundation as to where they're at. Um, so I recommend those two. I haven't used Bex, but I know Bex is widely used and I have not used the uh, SDS. But um, they've all shown high internal consistency and validity in chronic pain patients. So they're all, they're all valid to use. <clears throat> so chicken and the egg. Physiological similarities exist between chronic pain and depression. So, for example, noradrenaline and serotonin involved in the pathophysiology of depression also coincide with the anatomical descending inhibition of pain perception. These two neurotransmitters act in the limbic system and the PAG, the periaqueductal gray areas, to modulate the incoming pain stimuli. Antidepressants working through these neurotransmitters are also analgesics regardless of the presence of depression. So, Earlier, I believe we mentioned that um, analgesics were helping with depress depression as well as antidepressants helping with pain. So <clears throat> pretty interesting. This leads to the question of whether depression follows the establishment of chronic pain or whether chronic pain is a manifestation of a form of depression or a spectrum thereof. Some evidence exists for both views. So for example, Patients with pre-existing depression were found to be more likely to develop chest pain and headaches in a three-year period, kind of like what we said earlier. And conversely, a review of 40 studies supported the notion that depression is a consequence of protracted pain. The diathesis stress model for this conundrum is now growing in acceptance, which supports that depression is a sequela of chronic pain. Accordingly, people with a psychological predisposition superimposed with the stresses of chronic pain, go on to develop clinical depression. <clears throat> Anxiety is a physiological state characterized by cognitive, somatic, emotional, and behavioral components producing fear and worry. Anxiety is often accompanied by physical sensations such as heart palpitations, shortness of breast, breath, <laughs> wells, the cognitive component entails expectation of a diffuse and certain danger, as you all know. Generalized anxiety disorder is the most commonly diagnosed anxiety disorder in chronic pain populations, according to this article. Anxiety disorders are second only to depression. 
in psychological comorbidity and chronic pain populations. Whilst anxiety is a normal response in everyone, clinical anxiety results in increased intensity and prolongation of the feelings of dread that interfere with normal functioning. Measurements of anxiety with chronic pain also show strong association as with depression. One study in particular showed a doubling in the prevalence of anxiety disorders compared to the general population. It's thought to be an important mediator in the cognitive constructs of catastrophizing hypervigilance and fear avoidance and the exacerbation of pain experience. So some measurements uh, of anxiety and pain. Again, I just use the DAS because it measures both, which you see at the bottom right here. But they also have the pain anxiety symptom scale, which uh, you can use in the Fear of pain inventory measures degree of fear in the hypothetical pain inducing situations. I just use the DAS. I think it's a good one. If you don't have it, you can just download it on, on Google. It's it's great. It's short. Patients don't mind it. <laughs> um, so despite their differences in symptoms and classification, depression and anxiety seem to coexist or exist concurrently <clears throat> to a surprisingly frequent extent. In psychiatry, terms like agitated depression have been coined for a state of depression that presents as anxiety, which includes restlessness, insomnia, and nonspecific panic. I don't know why I'm doubling up on these. So here's another good paper. Um, depression in patients with chronic pain attending a specialized pain treatment center, prevalence and impact on healthcare costs. So a National Institutes of Health report in 2011 estimated the total annual incremental cost of healthcare due to pain in the United States at 261 to 300 billion. The total cost to society, however, including indirect costs of pain due to lower economic productivity, was estimated at over a half a billion. Half of, oh man, that's crazy. 560 to 635 billion, greater than the cost of heart disease, cancer, or diabetes. So, chronic pain and depression are each prevalent and often co occur, although the underlying mechanism of the interaction between pain and depression is not fully understood. Their coexistence has been shown to incur additive adverse effects on the patient outcomes, including poor functioning and reduced response to treatment. So here's a cool little video, Brain Changes in Pain. Um, I'm gonna play it for you. So I'll open this up. Pain perception and the human brain. Part of the survival value of pain is its association with learning centers in the brain. The brain circuitry associated with nociceptive and neuropathic pain involves areas considered to be essential in emotional learning, memory, and reward. The insula and anterior cingulate, together with the thalamus and basal ganglion, are most consistently activated in acute pain. The brain stem and the descending pain modulatory system also play a role, <clears throat> where activity is observed in both the anticipation and perception of pain. Clinical chronic pain causes increased activation of prefrontal cortical regions, which implies that chronic pain distorts the cognitive and emotional perception and processing of everyday experiences. Hypervigilance and an impaired ability to extinguish aversive associations of fearful or painful events seems to involve interaction among medial prefrontal cortex, basal ganglion, and amygdala which is consistent with clinical data indicating that chronic pain patients usually suffer from elevated anxiety, depression, and decreased quality of life. These observations demonstrate that the brain in healthy subjects is distinct from those with chronic pain, indicating that chronic pain is at least partly a neurodegenerative disease. So thank you, Wow House Pictures, for that cool video. I thought it was cool um, because it, you know, it did a good job of kind of animating and showing the effects of pain. And I think most importantly, as we'll see moving into this, uh, the effects of pain on the prefrontal cortex because the prefrontal cortex is what makes us human. Um, and 
It also helps us modulate our emotions and feelings. Uh, it helps shut down pain. So it's really important that the front part of the brain is working as good as it could. So pain processing in the human nervous system, a selective review of nociceptive and biobehavioral pathways. So the descending pain modulatory system exerts influences on nociceptive input from the spinal cord. This network of cortical, subcortical, and brainstem structures includes the prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate gyrus or cortex, the insula, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the PAG, the rostral uh, ventromedial medulla, and the dorsolateral pontine tegmentum area. The coordinated activity of these brain structures modulates nociceptive signals via descending projections to the spinal dorsal horn. So it's important that all of these areas, this network of all these different areas in the brain are working together in sync. The band is all there and they're playing in sync to be able to modulate the perception of pain. <clears throat> Here's a good little picture. I know we've probably seen a gazillions of these different pictures, but this involves also the corticolimbic striatal uh, circuits, which is what we're kind of talking about this week. So here you have the noxious stimulation, which causes the nociceptor stimulation, fires into the dorsal horn, fires up the spinal thalamic tracts, um, then you get the thalamocortical relays, so into the neuromatrix, they call it. So basically into the amygdala, the hypothalamus, <clears throat> um, into the parietal lobe. And then you get some inflammatory and biomolecular mediators, uh, which, you know, we, there's a ton. Um, you know, we can't forget that pain causes inflammation. Um, and then you get some autonomic reactivity. Hopefully the brain's working really good so that it can send descending modulation signals to the dorsal horn. But you also have these, um, these emotional reactions and behavioral responses. And these guys, when they get a little bit out of control, they can create some autonomic instability, for lack of a better word, within the nervous system. So there's a lot to read in these next two slides, but I'm just gonna read through them. So if you're driving in the car and you're listening, I'm reading it to you and you don't have to read it. So these emotions are coupled with autonomic. So they're talking about, the emotions they're talking about here are fear, anxiety, um, depressed mood. So they're coupled with autonomic endocrine and immune responses, which may amplify pain through a number of psycho um, physiological pathways. So for example, pain induction significantly elevates the sympathetic nervous system activity marked by increased anxiety, heart rate, and some galvanic skin responses. Furthermore, negative emotions and stress increase contraction of muscle tissue, elevated electromyographic activity occurs in the muscles of the back and the neck under conditions of stress, which we've all seen, some of us carry our stress there, uh, and negative effect and is perceived as a painful spasm. Trigger points, woof. This sympatho sympatho excitatory so basically sympathetic excitatory reaction coupled with emotions like anger and fear may reflect an evolutionary conserved active coping response to escape the painful stimulus yet negative emotional states intensify pain intensity pain unpleasantness and pain induced cardiovascular autonomic responses while reducing the sense of perceived control over pain so stress and negative emotions like anger and fear may temporarily dampen pain via the norepinephrine release, but when the sympathetic fight or flight response is prolonged or if it becomes negatively plastic, it can increase blood flow to the muscle and increase muscle tension, which may aggravate the original injury. Alternatively, pain inputs from the viscera and muscles may stimulate cardiac vagal premotor neurons, leading to hypotension, bradycardia, and hyperactivity to the environment a pattern of autonomic response that corresponds with passive pain, coping, and oppressed effect. Uh, if you have chronic hypotension, you don't get good blood supply to your brain. If you don't get good blood supply to your brain, you can't activate your prefrontal cortex. If you can't activate your prefrontal cortex, you can't modulate pain and you're in a depressed mood. That's kind of the way I read that sentence. In addition to autonomic reactivity, pro-inflammatory cytokines and stress hormone cortisol release during the experience of negative emotion, um, real quick on inflammatory cytokines and stress hormones. Inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6 have an affinity for your midbrain mesencephalon, 
area, so the very top part of your brainstem. And it has been shown in chronic stress patients in the literature that uh, hyperactive mesencephalic output can downregulate prefrontal cortex activation. So if you have inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 running through your bloodstream, your mesencephalon or your midbrain is going to have an affinity to attract that IL-6, which is going to lead to increased activation of your mesencephalon. Anytime that there, from what I've seen clinically, anytime that there's increased activation of your mesencephalon, you're going to have an increased activation of your fight or flight response, which means your 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 sympathetic your sympathetic system is just overactive. And when your sympathetic system is overactive, it's very difficult to get your frontal cortex flexed. That's what I tell my patients. It's very difficult to flex your frontal cortex when you're quote unquote hulking out, right? When your sympathetic nervous system is just overactive. Uh, another thing just to touch on that is cortisol. Cortisol is important, right? For your like cortisol with rhythms, but you know, chronic or the chronicity of cortisol responses in um, in response to stress, can they actually the cortisol have an affinity to your hippocampal areas and degenerate hippocampal and temporal lobe areas, which are responsible for memory, so short term memory. So now you're having this hyperactivation of your midbrain, downregulation of your frontal lobe, alterations in your hippocampal structures. So it's just really important that like the inflammation is checked. The inflammation can't go unchecked or else you're going to have negative plasticity in these pathways. <clears throat> so these biomolecular factors enhance nociception, facilitate processing of aversive information in the brain, and when there's release, um, when their release is chronic or current, it may cause or exacerbate tissue damage. Moreover, negative emotions are associated with increased activation in the amygdala, the anterior cingulate gyrus, and the anterior insula. These brain structures not only mediate the processings of emotion, but are also important nodes of the pain neuromatrix that tune attention toward pain, intensify pain, unpleasantness, and amplify interoception, which is the sense of the physical condition of the body, the internal physical condition of the body. So, when individuals experience negative emotions like anger or fear as a result of pain or other emotionally salient stimuli, the heightened neural processing of threat and affected brain circuits primes the subsequent perception of pain. And it increases the likelihood that sensations from within the body will be interpreted as painful. <clears throat> so that it's like a heightened state of awareness that, in my opinion, becomes negatively, negatively plastic. The fear of pain, a clinical feature of chronic pain patients, is associated with hypervigilance for and sustained attention to pain-related stimuli. Thus, negative emotions bias attention toward pain, which then increase its unpleasantness. In addition, negative emotions and stress impair the prefrontal cortex function, which is kind of like what I just said, which may reduce the ability to regulate pain using higher-order cognitive strategies, like reappraisal or viewing the pain as controllable and insurmountable. Basically... When your prefrontal cortex is not working the way it should, you can't be human. You can't control things. Sometimes you'll see these people stressing out very quickly. I call them close to threshold. They can't they can't regulate their emotions well enough. So it's important that the prefrontal cortex gets fixed. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to just throw in these last couple slides because I think it's important that, you know, with pain and with chronic pain, inflammation gets checked because the literature shows that a lot of these mood disorders like depression and anxiety can be due to a chronic inflammatory response that has not been addressed. So sometimes patients who are on anti-inflammatories, their depression will settle. I can't say that for everybody, but I've seen it happen. So this is a paper that just shows that an inflammatory response is um, associated with decreased functional connectivity within the reward-related circuits, including the ventral striatum and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So basically inflammation ba screws up the frontal lobe, <clears throat> as well as anxiety. So in conclusion, elevated inflammation is present in men with current anxiety disorders. So the inflammatory process needs to be checked. I think it's important that if we're providing primary care and we have patients in chronic pain and we also have patients that are suffering comorbid conditions such as depression and anxiety, 
we either do the blood work ourselves or we refer them out for blood work to look for some um, just some some systemic inflammatory markers, just like looking at CRP levels, homocysteine, making sure they're not anemic, stuff like that. So <clears throat> brain imaging tests for chronic pain, just a couple, uh, one short little excerpt from here. Chronic pain can modify brain pathways involved in endogenous pain control, making self-regulation of pain challenging, kind of like what I just said. Excuse me. This form of brain plasticity varies between individuals with chronic pain. It adds to the variability in pain processing and it might compromise treatment outcomes. So here's a really good image. Just wanted to show you guys brain pathways, regions, and networks involved in acute and chronic pain. So the frontal lobe is heavily involved. If the frontal lobe is not working, it can't modulate pain. Um, if this area becomes hyperactive, this is the mesencephalic uh, region, if it becomes hyperactive, it's going to further downregulate prefrontal cortex activation, which allows it to kind of go unchecked, and it just keeps firing and firing and firing, creating more inflammation, more chronic pain. <clears throat> and again, this is just a really good paper that shows that there are structural brain changes in chronic pain. So in this paper, they show that low back pain can cause sub and cortical reorganization which is not good for the brain. We've got to have a big, fat, healthy, juicy brain to be able to modulate pain, also to be able to modulate mood disorders such as anxiety and depression. So some conclusions, pain, especially chronic, is associated with depression and anxiety. The physiological mechanisms leading to anxiety and depression can be multifactorial in nature. Pain causes changes in the brain structure and function, and if this change in structure and function can alter the ability for the brain to modulate pain, it can as well um, alter the way that we control mood.